Well, I got invited here tonight to talk about my two favorite things, pots and people, right? So pots are something that I, I have been doing for the past 20 years. I've been making pots. I'm a formatively trained as a potter, traditionally trained. I was in England and worked as a potter. I've been making pots for 20 years. Now, the people side, I am that guy. I'm the guy in the grocery store, right? The guy in the grocery store who will tap you on the shoulder, who will get to know you, who will, you know the, you know the annoying guy, that guy? That, you know that guy, right? I mean, I am that guy. I will find a way to figure you out just, just for a moment, okay? So here's the, here's the issue. I've been making pots for 20 years, and I've been loving people for my whole life, and I need to find a way to go from one thing to another. So what's happening in this space right now is that there are cups being handed out to everybody in this space. Everybody is getting in a cup, either a kind of a winter tea bowl or an autumn tea bowl. Now I want you to hold this cup, and I want I want you out there to imagine this cup in your hand. I didn't anticipate this beautiful noise, though, but I love it. It's great. It's good. <laughs> I need to record that sound. Hopefully, we can hear it out there. So, I want you to imagine. You know, you're not. If you're not in this space, I want you to imagine this cup in your hand, and I want you to think about how this can be used. Very traditional ways. You might. Things might come to mind, like a cup of coffee. Things might come to mind, like some good scotch. But just think about how this cup will be used. And I'm going to take you through some things tonight. And maybe it will change the way you think about that. OK, so this change in me really occurred when I had children. And this, I think, is a common theme we had earlier tonight. So when you have children, you, you begin to look at memory a bit differently. I think it starts to, you know, you start to think about your aging. You have children. And, and memory becomes a really important thing. So this is an image of my son, Malcolm, and Ian. Uh, fishing last summer, late in the evening. I think it's a beautiful photograph. Well, here's the thing. We fish in a 1989 Crestliner boat, right? That 1989 Crestliner boat's a little ragged, right? The, the, uh, the carpet's a little worn out. Catches a lot of fish, and my sons remember that. So the, the tendency today would be to go, you know, I want to upgrade that boat, right? I think I need a faster motor. The thing is, my children don't care. They don't care if I get a new boat. All they care about is I'm fishing with them. And more importantly, they're interested in the memories that are contained within that boat that they sit in, that they almost fall out of when they catch their first walleye. So objects have memory. This cup in your hand, this cup that you can imagine out there, has a memory, right? Already. Already it's something else, right? OK, so the, my, the fascination with making the questions I would ask myself as a studio potter, oh, I want to get a better glaze, I want a better form, I want to do this kind of firing, those questions began to, to wear a little thin on me as an artist. I began thinking about other questions I could ask. Some of them ridiculous, I'm going to bring up a few of those. I'm going to go through how I, I ask these questions and then I begin to answer them. I begin to answer them in a way that moves this object, which is in your hands, into the hands of somebody else. It's that space between. So if we could imagine, that you are all people, right? Well, you are all people. And let's just imagine, I think it, maybe it's difficult or easy, imagine that I am art, right? Just, let's just, now, it's this space, right? Right here, it's the space. It's the space of acquisition, the space of how you encounter something, where there's so much potential in 21st century. Not only in the arts, I think you can apply that to any field. That space between whatever your profession is and the people that you serve. So I began asking new questions. Now, as an artist, I'm not bound by convention. That's the beautiful thing. I can ask questions that are not at all, maybe not at all possible. So here's what I start to think about. What if a cup could be like the late Charles Kuralt? What if this cup could travel into small towns and dig up those stories? You remember Charles Kuralt? He would do these, these stories that, like untold stories that would just come out of people. And you just, it was fascinating. It was really nothing, but at the same time, it was everything, because we could relate to that. So what if that cup could be like Charles Corral? Is that possible? It's a, little, it's a little ridiculous, but is it possible? Well, when you begin asking questions like that as an artist, it changes the way you work. I no longer think, what is the perfect glaze? Although I still chase that, I have to say, I love glazes. Wow. <laughs> 
But you begin asking these questions and you begin to answer them. And you answer them in ways that, that surprised me. So in 2010, I had took a trip to Dwight, North Dakota, and then a trip to Dwight, Nebraska. Now here is my intention of this trip. I was going to covertly, like a cup elf, maybe a cup Santa, right, sneak into Dwight, North Dakota, right, in Dwight, Nebraska. I was going to kind of tiptoe through. Oh, here's the issue, right? Physically, I am not sneaky, right? <laughs> I'm not stealthy, right? I can guarantee you I do not move in and out of shadows very easily, right? Problem, right? It's a problem. Second, I drive an, a Honda Element that's blaze orange. If you know this vehicle and you know that color, there is absolutely nothing <laughs> covert about that. Two strikes. Now, I didn't see this ahead of time, right? I'm like, oh, it's going to be great. Covert, cup elf, right? All that. So, the third strike. It's, it, it's the first beautiful day in North Dakota in the spring, right? It's 55 degrees. It's Sunday. What am I? Th it's Sunday. Be the first beautiful Sunday of the year. I come into town and I am not stealthy. Co I'm, I am, they know immediately. In fact, everybody knows. So what's beautiful about that is like any medium. If you, if you, I think everybody in here has experienced creating, right? We've made things. You respond to what happens. Well, I knew at that moment, I'm gonna take you through some slides, that this is my life's work. This is fairly stealthy, however. There's nobody home, right? <laughs> Then I met Ella. Now, Ella is 101 years old. She's nearly blind, and she turned the tables on me. I've gone through one of the best graduate schools in the country for my field. I learned more from Ella in 10 minutes, I think, than I learned in about 30 years of education. So Ella opened the door and said, oh, what you doing? What are you doing? I, mean, I, I can think of in her, in, her, in her place. It must have been very odd. And so I, I, I think I have a kind sort of demeanor, and I said, well, I'm just here to give you a cup. And, she, and to my amazement, she's like, well, come in and have a cup of coffee. And it's at that moment that I realized right, that this was it. Because this cup was not going to be sort of this covert opera. It was going to be a handshake. It was going to be a hello. It was going to be a, a way to have... 20 authentic minutes with somebody. In a world, as you know, where there's not a lot of those minutes out there, this was that moment, right? So 20 minutes later, Ella has schooled me on everything, including living in this house for 70 years. She has critiqued my cup more thoroughly than anybody ever has. Her hands were just all over it. And then in the end, she gave me a hug, and I went my way. It was a beautiful, beautiful moment. That friendship, a friendship can be 20 minutes is what she taught me. I met other people along the way in Dwight, North Dakota. This uh, group, this family was really, really terrific. In fact, they invited me into their camper. They were really accommodating, they were really amazing. And then, you know, they tried to sell me the camper in the end. I love that, right? Like, <laughs> I, and I was, I actually was almost biting. I had two young sons. I'm like, well, let me think about this. Let me call my wife, right? <laughs> so I actually, th I actually thought that would have been actually the perfect ending to that day is if I bought their camper, <laughs> right? Now that would be history embedded in this subject and they'd have a cup, right? There we could have this bridge. I've done this in other towns. I'm really, I work a lot and I love my students at North Dakota State University. Um, I involve them as much as I can and more and more in the work that I do. So this is a group of people, Amy Smith, Josh Zeiss, Meg Roberts, Maren Shalman, Linnea Curlin, my great friend Larry Pelter, all coming along with me. And all get to experience the same thing. It was that moment where you meet somebody in this cup. It wasn't, their, it wasn't necessarily their cup, but it was still the gesture. It's really about the gesture, isn't it? It's no longer about the cup. Oh, I love making cups, those glazes, right? Those glazes, <laughs> love them. So we made our way through this town, and then I met Violet. Now, <laughs> Violet had this amazing taxidermy collection. It actually scared me a bit, right? <laughs> Fantastic. I mean, this moose head was at eye level, which I've never experienced before. It was actually, and so she had to have a photograph. And then she had this amazing closet full of about 100 yarn-covered hangers. 
Okay, right now, that is a maker. I actually felt a bit inferior. I was like, okay, that is discipline, right? right? Now, she would not let me leave that house without giving me a hanger, right? Or a few. And I think Josh, who was with me, got one too. What if a cup could be a mediator between religious traditions? It's a very, it's a, it's a big concern of mine, the idea of kind of the relations between faith traditions in the world. So I took that problem or potential head on by creating a piece where this literally becomes a piece of journalism. Loosely, I think. We could maybe have a conversation about whether it's journalism, but I really think it is. So this was a project where I had a cup, a box, a camera, and a diary that, was, that traveled between four religious leaders across the country of the Buddhist, Muslim, Christian, and Jewish traditions. Traveled one by one from my own pastor, Steve Wold, at Trinity Lutheran Church, had to start there, to priest Kiyoki Roberts at the Pittsburgh Zen Center, to Iman Makran El Amin in Minneapolis, to Rabbi Stephen Carr Rubin in Los Angeles. So the piece traveled. Now, if you know a Lutheran basement, I can say this because I am Lutheran, you know what this is. This is mismatched furniture, right? <laughs> and what I love about this is that this is what Pastor Wold would take a photograph of this in, right? And as we travel through, things become mystical and interesting and intense. These images are really what I'm after. I make the cut, but that's the beginning. I'm really after the story. I'm after the interaction, the, that moment, right? And how do I capture that? Imam Makam El Amin, I don't have time to show you the writing, 18 minutes. But his writing was so intense about human dignity, about the connection that this cup gave him. Something, if you think about this, right, this cup that's in your hands or the cup that you're imagining, you put this to your lips, it's an intimate object. So this cup, which is in his hands, this is a terrific photograph, love that photograph. Then traveled to Rabbi Stephen Carr Rubin, where this is part of a union ceremony. This is a beautiful photograph. What I love about this photograph, one, is that the cup is, uh, I'm just happy to see the cup right in the middle of something. But more importantly, look at the looks of these people's faces, the love that, that she has for him, the, the really handsome guy in the front looking at us. What a terrific image. That can't happen unless I make this bridge make this, and make this happen. I would never meet them. I've never met, I've never met uh, Rabbi Stephen Carr Rubin in person, but I, I know a lot about him through this. What if the, a cup became the inspiration for an alternate economy? Really? <laughs> well, the way that we acquire things has a great deal of impact on what we own, doesn't it? Someone lends something to you and you forget to give it back to them? Does it have a sort of... You know, that's, maybe that sweater isn't so comfortable. A, a, a work of art that might be $500 to somebody might be nothing and be a year savings to somebody else, right? So let's think about that. What if there's a way to create an economy where what we do is, I mean, within, within the realm of the, of the arts in this case, we create an economy that's based not on, on gold but on people's time old traditional way of working. So over the course of the, of the uh, studio call weekend, I uh, launched this project, and I was amazed by the reception. We raised the equivalent, I love the equivalent of, the equivalent of hiring somebody full-time for, for four months of work, doing goodness in the community. All through little interactions and cups and pots, but people were investing. Now here's the thing, when they acquired that object, it was connected directly to community service that they were doing in the, in the city. So that cup, say, right, was 30 hours, of, 30 hours of community service. So how would that community service then be connected to that cup and vice versa? How would that change your understanding of that object? So I make dinnerware sets, but with one rule, right? I will make a dinnerware set for you if I can come and sit down and have dinner Know what you eat, see what you do, see your house. And if that's too intimate for you, 
I'm not interested. <laughs> that's, 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 my, I, that's my rule. <laughs> so this is a family that did, a family that did uh, 150 hours of community service. They're doing it right now. This is actually happening right now. So they're, the, the wife, she's, she's um, completely re-landscaping an elementary school. The husband, he's working with inner city, um, new interest inner city fathers in Minneapolis to uh, mentor them on being better fathers. So this dinnerware set, right? This dinnerware set that holds macaroni and cheese, or maybe something better, is always connected, again, to that community service. I'm interested in that. That's, that's rich to me. That's worth far more than the money I would get for that object. I'm not interested in that money. I'm interested in how the history of that object is enhanced through that experience. What if a cup could inspire the trading of an object long lost forgotten? Now that is a poster, and I didn't make it. <laughs> Jordan Nelson, who's a student at North Dakota State, made this. And in fact, it's hot off the press because he sent me an email about an hour ago. <laughs> so what I'm doing, I have this project called the Misfit Cup Liberation Project. Crazy name, right? So I would bet, I gotta look, I would bet that you have a cup in your cabinet. And, and it's this cup that every time you open the door and you mix a drink, you pass this cup by, right? <laughs> For a variety of reasons, right? Right? I mean, that cup is, I don't know, a snowman. Whoever thought that a plastic cactus martini glass was a good idea, huh? You did one night, right? <laughs> right? You did. Well, it's there, and here's the deal. I have a heart for that cup. In fact, I've created an orphanage, as I like to think, and I really do. Like, I want to liberate that cup. I want it out. Let's get this thing out. So I've created this project where you can bring in that cup, and I'm going to give you a fresh cup for that cup. Again, let's think about the connection. I get your cup, but your cup is always linked to the cup you gave me. And so when you use that cup, you're going to remember that cup, and you're going to remember the exchange. You're not going to remember the 25 bucks that you spent on the cup. I guarantee you that. But you're going to remember that. This is where work takes this turn, just like I talked about earlier, where it changes in front of you. I thought it would be all about bad design, right? I thought that what we would have was what we just saw. In fact, here's a cup, and here's the, here's the, the note that comes with it. This cup is ugly because it reminds me of the death of my grandmother. Petunias were her favorite summertime flower. I gave her a bouquet of flowers in this cup during her final hospital stay. So at that moment, this becomes a cathartic object. It becomes something, she didn't want this in her cabinet, but she couldn't do anything with it. For me, that's a real transformation. I acquire that object, I'm gonna give it a safe home, and she's gonna have a new cup, a placeholder. I'm gonna continue this project in about 10 different cities. I, want to, I really wanna do it globally because I'm really interested on some level what these cups look like in other people's cabinets that don't live in North Dakota, right? <laughs> what do they look like in South America? What do they look like in Africa? What do they look like in Asia? Like, what do those cups look like? So I guess you could say I'm an anthropologist or a sociologist or maybe an artist, but I'm not worried about that. So let's get back to this cup that's in your hands the cup that you're imagining. This cup is yours for a moment, because my challenge to you is to think of the way that I have found new ways for, this, for my work to move into the world, and I'm giving you that, this cup and this opportunity to do the same. Over the next couple of weeks, you'll think about it. Something will come to mind. What I want you to do is move that into space and have that memory. When you do, I'm gonna give you a new cup, but I want you to tell me the story. Thrive, thank you. <laughs>